Thank you. Good morning. I am so happy to be here with my good friend, the very brilliant Cecilia Winyos, who I haven't seen in too long. Um, you know, I grew, I don't know about you, but I grew up in the era when cities were losing jobs and sitting, yeah, sort of losing too. population. Um, uh, New York, Ford to New York, drop dead was kind of the headline of my high school gradu graduation. Mm -hmm. You know, now we've seen in the Bay Area one of the greatest economic booms in terms of job creation and wealth creation, really in the history of the world. And yet when we go around to cities around the country, emerging tech centers from scale of Seattle, which is past emerging, to Austin, to Pittsburgh, Denver, what we hear so often is, we don't want to be the next Bay Area. Yeah. I, how do we, how have we gotten to a point where a level of economic activity and growth that would have been unimaginable in the New York that I grew up with is now being seen as a mixed blessing at best and maybe even something of a negative for part of the community at worst? Well, I think that has to do with the, the visibility of some of the problems that, that have been created. There was already you know, made mention today of, uh, of the housing and homelessness crisis in this area, which sort of results from the great disparities. But uh, look, I think there are two things are true. One is that there is a sense of, um, you know, forgive me, I lived mm. in the Bay Area for a little time. I have mm. a lot of affection for you here. But there is some disconnectedness. I mean, I a, a friend of mine who lives here in the tech industry just the other day was describing it as a lot of people who were scurrying around building things to solve their own problems and get you know, sushi mm. delivered 15 minutes earlier. <laughs> and while like, I know that's a great re reduction and probably really unfair, there is some truth to that. Um, there is some disconnectedness between what happens here and the rest of the country. And of course, the economic growth hasn't been shared. Yeah, right. What does it take to create economic growth, tech-driven economic growth? That is, more broad. is there any city that has solved the puzzle? No, I don't think so. Not yet. I, and I hope someone disagrees with me because I would love to hear about that. Um, but I think it's important that we think about tech not just as an industry but as a set of skills that mm. can and should be deployed anywhere in the country to make sure that we are collectively using the best tools to solve our, to solve our public problems. And if we think about that, um, it, I think it gives you access to a different way of thinking mm. about how tech can, how, can help revitalize a city. Um, you know, not every place in America is going to have a booming tech industry, and that's not, it, it's already not the answer to inequality here, and it's arguably exacerbating it here. Um, but if you think of tech as a set of skills, a set of capacities that we want to make sure that people broadly have, are trained with, uh, are able to deploy, then you can start deploying it in city government in different mm -hmm. ways. You can start deploying it <clears throat> in other kinds of industries in other ways. You, can, you should be deploying it. In NGOs, that's the world that I come from, and part of the reason that, that I'm at New America now leading, among other things, a project on public interest technology is because I came away from government with the insight that like, this is a set of skills that my sector, the NGO sector, really needs to do the stuff that we do. Well, let's separate those two pieces, equipping the people, equipping the government. First on equipping the people, when John Hickenlooper now seems to be running for president. Um, when he was the mayor of Denver, he used to talk about something that he called the Denver paradox. Yeah. And he said, we have such a booming economy and such a great quality of life that we are attracting people from all over the country and indeed all over the world to come and compete and move here uh, and, and work in our industries. But we can't get our own kids from our own low-income and minority neighborhoods on track to compete for the jobs that we're creating. How common is that problem? It's happening everywhere. We used to, when I worked in government, we used to hear this from... Um, certainly from the corporate sector, but from communities around the country, pe people would say, look, we are looking for people we actually want to hire for diversity, and we are looking for people who have the skill sets that we need, and we can't find them. And that's because we're not growing our own. We are not adequately training folks coming through our educational system. And, and we are, and you heard Eloy, the chance yeah. to talk about it two panels ago, as well as Nicole, it has to do with how well we're preparing people in the K through 12 system, how well we're preparing them um, uh, in, in higher education. Um, and it has to do with, with networks, right? Like mm. even if folks are, are decently prepared in the educational system, they're not necessarily traveling in circles that give them access to these, to, to the kinds of opportunities that are available. Like we've met with you know, people in Chicago who don't know, they, that, who haven't seen the lake or the industry, or wow. you know, industries yeah. in other parts of the city, yeah. we are too isolated as Americans, and we're not doing enough and, to break through those that isolation. And as you may have noticed, we're having a little bit of a debate in this last week about what who qualifies as an American in the yeah. in the in the twenty first century. 
And one of, the, one of the dynamics here is that the same places that are the booming tech places are also where the locus of demographic change is happening. That is happening predominantly, not exclusively, but most aggressively in urban America. And yet there is a disconnect. Well, it's an enormous disconnect, right? And I, I again, the tech industry is not nearly diverse enough, and, and, it, and it knows it. Uh, but the question is, like, how do you change that? One of the solutions that I'm working on has to do with um, helping folks understand that you could use this skill set more broadly, right? So we're, we're, I'm involved in trying to build a field of public interest technology the way there's a field of public interest law, mm -hmm. um, in, in part because I think we need that skill set to help us solve public problems in government and among NGOs. But also, if you think about who... Um, the kinds of people who might seek an engineering degree or a computer science degree because they want to end homelessness and they see that skill set mm. as a set of tools that you would use to solve that problem, I believe those people are more likely to be women and people of color. Um, and we want to create avenues for them to, to, to um, recognize that the things that they may care about, be passionate about, that there are pathways for them to develop those skills and use those skills in their own communities. Let me ask one more question before we get to how that side, how cities and other institutions can use these technologies and skills. You're worried that the trajectory we're on may actually further exacerbate some of these problems because as we move into the AI era, mm -hmm. who are the most vulnerable? I mean, I think there's some misconceptions about who may be the, vo what uh, kind of employment may be the most vulnerable to the AI changes. So if you think about, like, what's the picture in your head when, yeah. you, when you think about automation and when you think about the coverage that we see about how automation is changing the workforce, we get pictures of truck drivers, which is important, mm -hmm. and we get uh, pictures of, like, factory floors. Of it's like those trucks in the Wolverine movie in 20 <laughs> years with nobody in them, which are very disconcerting, yes. Right, so we think about the manufacturing sector, we think about truck drivers, but yeah. we know from the data that the people who are disproportionately likely to be affected by automation are women. Yeah. Um, women and people of color, and Latinos in particular. Um, and that has to do with where we're located in the workforce. So that's clerical workers, that's back office workers, that's re retail, retail workers. Um, and so it, it's important that, that we have a, a conversation that's like fully inclusive about who it is who's likely to be affected. One, and that we not just have that conversation about those people, but that we actually, and this goes back to something Sarah said at the beginning, that we actually have the conversation with those people and engage the folks who are likely to be affected by automation, who are the, the objects of this policy conversation, if you will, in the conversations about what is changing, not just to understand what their circumstances are so that we can better address them, but maybe actually to have folks at the table in local communities helping drive the conversation mm. about how to leverage technology to create the inclusive local economies that we're hoping to create. Talk, as, talk about that now. Well, I, I in mean, your work with as, cities on that. As much as I'm a, like, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a policy nerd. I'm not actually a tech person. I'm a policy nerd. Mm. That's what I am. But I, am, I have enough humility about it to know that I think we have been, that we do way too much guessing about what's going to be impactful and about, about the folks who are the point of the policy-making exercise. And part of the reason I'm doing what I'm doing now is um, because I think out here we have, in this part of the country, we have invented a set of techniques that allow certainly the Silicon Valley to get inside our heads. Yes. They are figuring out what certainly what certainly what my children are going to be addicted to on their screens. I, and not only our children, as we look around the audience, and my, my it, it children, might apply to the contemporary generation well, as well. And my children are, yes. are adults, but the things you and I are going to get addicted yeah. to, like there, somebody's yeah. figuring that out already. You it's can use those, well. yeah. right. But you can use those same techniques, the techniques of user-centered design, the mm. techniques of product design, to engage... Um, I think about this all the time. The people who um, are should be benefiting from the earned income tax credit, but who aren't. Twenty percent of people who are eligible for the ITC don't participate. We can be using those techniques to engage those folks, not just in understanding what the barrier is to participating, but actually to, to, mm. to design the next iteration of the policy. California is in a conversation yeah. about expanding the ITC. We want that to be a national conversation. We will do a better job of helping lift people out of poverty if we actually use these tools to engage those folks, not just 
in helping us understand them better, but in the design of the policy and in its Engage implementation. Them. Another area, opioid mapping. You're yeah. working with cities. Talk about that. Yeah. How, how, what, what can you do there? So this is a project that also sprang out of our public interest tech work. Um, we had a public interest tech fellow who, who lost a sibling to the opioid epidemic, and he does data mapping for a living. So we started by mapping, um, creating a map that allowed you to post a picture of the person you loved and lost. And working together, he, we figured out a way for him to engage with about a dozen counties, and he helped counties map the data that they have that relates to the opioid epidemic. So di typically in a local jurisdiction, different agencies have different data sets. There's The fire department knows about how many um, overdose calls it went on, and the public health department has prescribing information, and different... There's different data sets that exist within the same jurisdiction, but they're not talking to each other. So just by helping about a dozen counties map the data that they already had, he helped them begin to see when are overdoses happening. It turns out in Tempe, Arizona, they happen more on Tuesdays between the hours, like in the early mm. evening hours, among men in a particular age group and in particular neighborhoods. And once you begin to see that kind of data, you, you can actually organize a response that's more effective than the old way, which was to report your data to the CDC, and then two years later you get a report about what was happening two years ago in Tempe, Arizona. Wow. So, uh, and um, we have a, a project that helps place technologists in congressional offices, because we know Congress is not quite ready to do the policy making we need them to do. Um, uh, and one of them recently helped draft legislation. I just got a report from my colleague this morning that says that now the federal agencies now need now are going to be required to have chief data officers. Um, and the, re the reason that that's really great news is because government, and not just governments, but also NGOs and um, you know and companies and agents of civil society can and should be using data. There's a lot that's available. Yeah. You can use it in ways that actually help solve local public problems, all you know, major national public problems. We're not doing enough of it yet, We're, but there's no reason that we can't. But that's about deploying what I think of as broadly as a tech skill set um, in the service of, of addressing the things that we worry about. Were you pushed in this direction at all by your scarring experience of uh, healthcare.gov? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yes. In, Which was basically a watershed moment in kind of realizing how far behind government was where it needed to be. Exactly. And I give President Obama and his chief of staff at the time, Dennis McDonough, a lot of credit for not just organizing to fix the website, which we did, by the way, and mm. 20 million people got health care. I, I feel like I have to say that. <laughs> um, but we learned we didn't have an engineering problem. It was a management problem. Gov the stuff mm. that people mm. in the Silicon Valley do every day before breakfast, government doesn't do very well. But we recruited, and this yeah. was a transformative experience for me as a policymaker, we recruited hundreds of people from out here. And the pitch was sounded like this. We want you to come and do a two-year tour of duty like the Peace Corps and earn a tiny fraction of what you're making now and work in a windowless office at an agency that totally yeah. doesn't understand what you do. But if you figure it out, you get to help 20 million people yeah. get health care, or you, help to, you get to transform the way benefits are the delivered to veterans. Hand. The people who thought that was a cool idea are the ones who came. Yeah. And a lot of them had trouble coming back. Um, and one of the, the, these are my friend Mikey Dickerson's words. He said them in public, so I'm not outing him. He, he helped lead the U U.S. Digital Service. He said, I went back to Google and I tried to care about my job and I couldn't do it. I was using this, the skill set that I used to help 20 million people get health care to invent the next way people are going to wow. send each other pictures of their cats. And yeah. it just didn't feel as good. All right. Before I bring in the audience, before I want to bring in the audience, but I can't have you up here with all of your expertise without asking you to comment on what's happening at the border, mm. and how Democrats should be responding, and why you don't think the hand-raising on decriminalizing the border is the direction they should go. I believe deeply that the American public expects their policymakers to come up with solutions to, to both to manage the border and to make sure that we can be a nation of laws and a nation of immigrants at the same time. That is something we are utterly capable of, and right now, the, the, the ground is wide open for, I mean, I served a Democratic president for, for anybody, but I hope this person will be a Democrat to come forward and say, this thing, this thing is fixable. 
Um, we can have an orderly system that protects people, including people who are fleeing for their lives, um, and still maintains the integrity of the border. That is not beyond the United States of America, and I believe Democrats should own that. And I, I don't think the conversation about decriminalizing migration gives us, and it gives, like my sister in Dearborn, who comes from the same immigrant family that I come from, the thing that she expects from her government, which is just to understand how it's going to work so that it is both orderly and generous, and we and, can do that. And the key, just real quick, the key to an asylum system that can handle the volume we're dealing with, but in a more humane way, is... Doris Meisner from the Migration Policy Institute, who is a former INS commissioner, argues there is an asylum corps already in the federal government that can be deployed to adjudicate asylum claims and can get to accurate answers more quickly and efficiently so that the, the people who are fleeing for their lives get protected and we can deal humanely with the people who, who don't qualify. All right, audience. Uh, hi, my name is Sahil. I'm an engineer at Airbnb. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I see a lot in the tech industry um, incentivizing diversity, which is um, good, but I think for structural chains, we can't depend on capitalism to have a conscience. Um, so, <laughs> Amen. Uh, California recently passed a law that you may know of that requires women to um, be on all corporate boards, mm -hmm. um, which is great, but I don't think far enough. Um, what do you think about uh, implementing policy that forces equitable, pro equitable practices in the tech industry instead of asking nicely? Yeah, so I definitely don't think we can count on industry to police itself. Um, we've seen, we've made that mistake with respect to other sectors. I actually had a colleague who sort of lifted up the food industry, for example, and that didn't, it didn't go well. Um, at, you know, and we have an obesity epidemic as a result mm. of that. We, so I don't think we can count on the industry to police itself. I think policy, policy tools are, can, can be important. They're frequently blunt instruments. Um, that can sometimes lead to unintended consequences. So I also think community organizing and public outcry, and I heard a speaker here uh, on one of the panels yeah. earlier say having media attention is important to get companies to do the right thing, which is great, but it shouldn't just be media attention. I mean, the media attention suggests that there is somebody paying attention yeah. to the media and willing to do some yelling, and I think the yelling is important. And so our strategies about how we move things within companies, how we move things within cities, how we insist on growth being equitable, has to do with sort of the skills and the talents that the Shared Prosperity Partnership is, is working on, building and understanding. And I also think it has to do with engagement of communities that should be insisting that the you know, exponential growth we see in places like this be inclusive. One more, yeah, here. Hold on, uh, Mike coming or not? Yes, working, working our way forward. Thank you. My name is uh, Graham Richard. I'm the former mayor of Fort Wayne, Indiana. Mm -hmm. And I had an experience around the Institute for City Design as a new mayor acquainting us with some of the best practices mm -hmm. for city design. And my question is, related to a panel pr prior to this as well, have you considered at New America, by the way, thank you for your magnificent service uh, for you. our country and the president, have you considered at New America an intersection like that Institute for City Design, where you would have technology folks meeting with mayors in small group sessions, because there's a huge mm. gap between the knowledge, yes. the talent, and the technology innovation. And to me, that would be, uh, have you considered something like that, or maybe something like that now exists that is not extended to the smaller city mayors? It's a great idea, and the problem that you raise, the challenge that you raise, is something that we wrestle with all the time, which is making sure that somebody is focusing on providing capacity in, in parts of the country that are, that are getting left behind or that are not going to be able to develop this capacity by, by themselves. Fort Wayne may not end up having an enormous tech industry, but Fort Wayne, Flint, Michigan, all kinds of places that I, that I think about all the time, uh, should be innovators, and there's no reason they can't be innovators. So this question of how to make sure we are, we collectively are being thoughtful about creating capacity everywhere in the country and not just in the places that are already primed to catapult forward is essential. We can't, um, we are running the risk of exacerbating inequality by geography because a lot of 
folks are investing in all of the same places, and the, yeah. it's a big country. I mean, and, and, I'll, and as a final question, I mean, this is the big paradox, right? Because you can debate forever how much of Trump country was driven by racial animosity or feeling of economic left behind. But there's no question there are big parts of the country that feel left behind as we go through this transition. And yet here, in the places that are benefiting most from the transition, in many ways, they feel almost overwhelmed by it, and that it is uh, eroding the quality of life for anyone who is not at the absolute vanguard yeah. of it. So is there any way for the water to find a more common level, or is this just kind of economic, what you say, the increasing geographic inequality, uh, economic inequality, is that just the track we're on? Well, so I think... With discontent on both sides. The thing that doesn't work about your sort of water level analogy is that that's like a force of nature, like yeah. the water's going to find the leveling no matter what, and that's not true in this case. It has to be intentional. It has to be deliberate. We have to be trying to create equity or else we're not going to create it. And that's at every level that we need that. We need government to be focused on that. We need the companies to be focused on that. We need people to be focused on it and insisting on it if it's going to happen. We can't... It's. E any, each of those levers by itself is going to be insufficient. It, so it, we need to, it needs to be deliberate and it needs to be coming from every direction. We would all benefit from listening to you for the rest of the morning, but the <laughs> other people standing in the stairway would not like that one bit. Indeed. So we're going to surrender it now. Thanks, Cecilia Munoz. Thank you very much.